All right, let's open our Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 20. And Lord willing, we will finish Acts uh, 20 today, uh, tonight. Tonight we have communion and um, be spending some time waiting on the Lord and we'll take the communion and then uh, also hopefully finish out Acts chapter 20. So we spent some time the last few weeks, Sunday morning and Sunday night, slowing down our, our normal pace through the scriptures uh, to focus in. These lessons um, are very important. They're fundamental, and they, they are important not just if you're an elder. This is a, a message of, of Paul the Apostle to a group of elders from a city called Ephesus. He was traveling on his way to Jerusalem, and uh, he didn't want to stop in Ephesus. He was trying to hurry to get to Jerusalem to make one of the major feasts, and so he just sent a messenger in, and the guys came out and met him at the beach so they could just have their meeting, and he could get on the boat and take off. So um, this of the addresses that we have in the book of Acts, we have um, a time when, they were, when there was a big conflict about whether or not Gentiles had to be circumcised. We have that record. We have Paul preaching to an angry mob that was trying to kill him. We have a record of that. We have Stephen's message right before the Jewish leaders killed him. Uh, we have Paul's message in, in a synagogue to unbelieving Jews preaching the gospel to them. So we've got this great variety of uh, addresses or messages that are given by the apostles or the early Christians recorded for us in the book of Acts. But this one's unique because it's to leaders. It's to believers. We have this section um, in the historical narrative of this message of Paul to these leaders in the church in Ephesus. So we've gone through it, but we'll just go ahead and read it again. I can't read it too many times. Hopefully these things will sink into my head. So verse 17 is where we'll start, Acts chapter 20, verse 17. From Miletus he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they'd come to him, he said to them, You know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews, how I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God." And indeed, now I know that you all, among whom I've gone preaching the kingdom of God, will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. <clears throat> and now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I've coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who are with me. I've shown you in every way, by laboring like this, that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he'd said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all, and then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they should see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Lord, we do thank you for having this message recorded for us. We don't know, Lord, if it was much longer and, and Luke summarized it or if this was actually what was said, but, Lord, this is what we have. And we know, Lord, that your word is able to wash us and cleanse us. We pray that it would. We know, Lord, that your word is able to correct us, and if we need correcting, we pray that you would straighten us out and it instructs us in righteousness. If we need to learn about what righteousness is, Lord, we pray that you'd open our hearts to receive an understanding of, of the right way. Lord, that you'd show us how to walk, that you would inspire us, Lord, by these words, that we would 
know that we can make an impact in this world in these last days, and we pray that you'd help us. Speak to us, Lord. Encourage us and give us vision, Lord, for what you want to do in our lives, and we ask these things in your name. Amen. Well, we're moving along through this, and we're coming now near to the end of it, and this morning where we pick up is in verse 28. He's already covered his example, and he's already talked about his own personal experience, what he's going through, what he's about to go through, and his perspective on it. Very important lessons. The last section right before where we're at is is, uh, his ministry, emphasizing the Word of God, and now the rest of the letter is much more of a direct charge to them about what God wants them to do. So it has the therefore in verse 28. In light of the things that I've said, in light of my example, which you already know, and in light of what's already taken place, now this is going to be going forward. Therefore, and the first thing is take heed. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. Now because he's speaking to leaders, uh, a leader is a person who, who's not, as a, from a Christian perspective, the way Jesus taught about leadership. A Christian leader is not someone who gives orders to everybody else so that everybody else knows what they're supposed to do. Um, That's Jesus' job. His title is Lord. (laughs) The the Christian leaders, well, Jesus said, if you want to be great in my kingdom, then you need to be the servant of all. So the Christian leaders have a totally different perspective. And in a worldly sense, and in in the way the world thinks of leadership, you have the person who's the CEO, well, they're, they're telling everybody else what to do. And you have a CFO, and they're manage, and you've got a controller, and they're man, and, and there's, there's this, there's a kind of a top-down hierarchy of, of, and obviously you have to divide the labor up, and, 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 you know, we've developed the corporate structures we have, they're, they're effective at making products and getting things done, but the church isn't about making products, the church is about making disciples, and you don't, you don't produce products the way you produce disciples, and Jesus certainly didn't, he doesn't look like a CEO, does he? He doesn't look like a person who's going around making something for himself. Whenever they try to advance him or promote him, or even when people came, even his own brothers came and said, here's how you should go forward. You need to promote yourself. And Jesus did the exact opposite. When they would want to come and say, these cities all want you to be something, he left and went to the little cities. When his brothers said, go down to Jerusalem and show yourself, that's, you're doing a terrible job of marketing. Well, Jesus wasn't trying to market himself. His, his ministry is going to be done by the Spirit. So, um, when we think about a message to Christian leaders, we're going to have a, a very different uh, emphasis than you'd have if you were at a worldly leadership seminar. The first thing that Paul tells them is you need to watch out for yourself because primarily the Christian leader is an example. Primarily the Christian leader is an example. So if you're a husband and you don't like your wife and you look at her and you think, I'm going to go through the Bible, I'm going to find some good verses for her. I'm going to you know, assemble them. I might even make a PowerPoint. And, uh, and, and then you might even use the phrase, and then I'm going to sit her down. There's a lot of ladies laughing and not many men on that last little part. <laughs> you can feel the heat up here. Ooh, hot around the collar. I'm going to sit her down, and then I'm going to just tell her what the Bible says a woman's supposed to be and what her role is. No, listen, if you pulled out all the Bible verses, are they all true? Sure. Do they all apply? Absolutely. Ladies, is that how your husband's going to minister to you and influence you? Well, it'll influence you. Maybe not in the way he wishes. Right? An example. If you want to influence your kids, if you want to change your workplace, if you got dropped into a workplace and it's just a filthy wretch of sinfulness and wickedness and people lie and they cheat and they don't do what they're supposed to do and no one works hard and you're in that really corrupt situation listen the christian model is example so that's why paul would say here take heed to yourself the first thing that in light of because the first thing he points to is his example as you look back through the section he starts off you know what kind of a man i was among you now he says now therefore The guys that you're among, they need to know what kind of a man you are among them. You'll you'll teach your sons a work ethic by them watching you work. You'll teach your daughters how to love and care. You'll you'll teach them about how to work hard. You'll teach them about their opportunities by them watching you take steps of faith and watching you uh, uh, see the plan of God unfold and take risks and move into it. Your, Your children will learn how to overcome their fears when they watch their parents overcome their fears. 
The example is the most powerful way to change people's lives. Now, the example is usually the least utilized tool to change people's lives because it's the most difficult. Because for me to be an example, that means I'm going to actually have to overcome my fears. I'm going to actually have to develop a work ethic. I'm going to actually have to tell the truth when it's difficult. I'm going to have to hold my tongue when I want to say something. If, if I'm going to be an example, that means all the things I want someone else to learn, I actually have to learn them myself. And that's a terrible way of going about. I mean, if, if you just think naturally, I can't tell you how many times I heard this advice from my dad. Do what I say, don't do what I do. I think the first time I heard that, I thought, that ain't going to work on me, Dad. <laughs> Your Jedi mind tricks are only for the weak-minded. You know, I'm not going to fall for that. Do what you say, don't do what you do. Give me a break. Really. If you can't do it, why would I take you serious? Anything that you say seriously. But then you've got a, another person who has taken heed to themselves and the impact that that person has. You know, the things that are said at their funeral, <laughs> the, the, when, they're, when they get their going away party from the job, the things that are said, when a person just quietly, even with almost without saying very much, can have a huge impact, even in an entire organization. So Jesus taught us that. Jesus was an example. He, uh, he wouldn't have been hired by Apple, I promise you. Um, he could have been, right? Um, easily. Uh, he's smart enough. But he's not going to be hired by a Fortune 500 company to go out and, and get the branding right and do this thing right. Because if you look at Jesus, he didn't do any of that stuff like that. He's God in the flesh, and no one knows. <laughs> well, why do that? Well, if you watch and pay attention, you can tell. But the, the people that are looking for the grandiose and the, the extravagant and that which would promote glory to self, none of that's there in Jesus' life. And so now we're, we're his leaders under him. We're servants. We're following that example. So we don't get to be leaders like the world says there's leaders. We're leaders like Jesus was a leader, which is we're servants. And, and we serve, and we are an example. So the therefore is, therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock. The idea of taking heed means to be vigilant, to be watchful, to be paying attention. If you want to make an impact, if you want to have an, an influence in the world that you live in, then you're going to have to pay attention. Now, I'm not saying you're going to have to watch Fox News 24-7, because that will probably mess you up. Or that you listen to Rush Limbaugh every day and you let that just stuff just go in your mind and so the rest of the day all you are is angry about everything that's bad. Okay? That's not a political statement about that. So, you know, there's just the way the world is. But if you take heed to yourself, that means you're paying attention. It doesn't mean that you're totally chasing down every weird straw man that any person builds. That's not taking heed to yourself or to the flock. If you're going to take heed to yourself, you have to have your eyes on Jesus. That's an interesting thing, isn't it? To take heed to yourself, you don't look at yourself. To take heed to yourself, you have to look at Jesus. And if you're looking at Jesus, then you'll see yourself. The best way to take, care, take heed to yourself is to fix your eyes on Jesus. Get your, get your orientation towards heaven. To get into the Word of God and to know what it says about the days that you're living in. Yes, we do pay attention to the politics. In our country, we get to vote. What a blessing. You should know what you're voting for. You should know who you're voting for. You should know what they believe about the different issues instead of going, my parents were this, I'm this, I'm voting this. Yeah, but did you know this person believes X, Y, Z? Well, I don't care what they believe. We've always been this, and that's what I'm voting. Do you know that this is what they stand for? Do you know this is what they promote? So you should educate yourself. You should know. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But when it comes to what Paul's talking about, to make an influence in the world, because we, you can have one political party in, then you have another political party in, and then you've got the heart and the conscience of the nation, and the political parties can't change people's lives. But the followers of Jesus change people's lives. And how do they do it? They do it by taking heed to themselves and to the flock. Being aware, paying attention, knowing what the Lord's speaking to you. What's the Lord speaking to you? You know, if you want to make friends at the church and you see somebody, maybe you've bumped into them a couple times or you're, you're sitting in your own little uh, continent in the church building here. I remember years ago, one of the guys he used to always sit on this side right here. One day he came up to me and he goes, I'm going on the mission field. And I go, really, where? And he goes, no, to the back left part of the church. I'm going over there. I'm going to go on the mission field. You remember that? <laughs> so, you know, 
You, you know, you sit by people, and you see them a few weeks, and you're like, oh, I kind of recognize that person. You start to talk with them, you find out where they work or whatever. Here's a great question to ask somebody. What's the Lord been speaking to you lately? What's the Lord been speaking to you? You know, and maybe they're fired up about something, and they, they blah, blah, and they, a little bit of a rant going on, and they, they take a breath. So what's the Lord been speaking to you? I can tell Rush has been speaking to you, but what, what's the Lord been speaking to you? I, I can tell you've been on Facebook a lot, and you now know the three things that will hurt, the five things, the seven things, the six things, the two things that everybody needs to know. If they're gonna... <laughs> You've been doing this, like, well, what's the Lord saying to you? Take heed to yourself and then to all the flock. The idea of, of having your eyes off of yourself. They, these are people that have grown to maturity. Now, when we get saved, the Bible talks about how we can be babies in Christ. And when you have a brand new baby, babies need to be taken care of. Babies need their food prepared for them, and they learn how to eat themselves. When you have a little baby, you feed the baby, right? Because if you just gave a baby a spoon, the baby would starve because the spoon wouldn't make it to the mouth too many times. It would make it to the floor. It would make it everywhere. Uh, you know, a lot of people have that family tradition where it's the first birthday, and the, you give your child the cake, and they just go at it. And more cake is on the kid than in the kid. Because, you know, for this person to be able to grow and get the nutrition, I'm going to decide what you eat, and I'm going to take it, and I'm going to actually put it into your mouth, and I'm going to know how much is here, and then I'm going to know exactly what it is, and then I'm going to make sure that most of it's going to get in there and go down. That's what you do with a baby. But, you know, you don't do that with your teenagers, I hope. I mean, if you're having to do that with your teenagers, well, so, then you start to grow. We're going to actually cover that passage that where uh, John talks about that in 1 John. I've written to you, fathers, because you know him who's been from the beginning. I've written to you, young men, because you're strong and the word of God abides in you and you've overcome the wicked one. And I've written to you, children, because you've believed in the Father. The, the, these stages of growth where you have a child and, man, they just know God, they're saved, and, and then people are taking care of them. But then a young man, well, you're expecting the young man to be able to go out and do some chores, you're expecting the young man to be abiding in the Word and have the Word abiding in him. and doesn't need somebody to feed him anymore. There's a young, there's a young man, and, and he, that, that guy can take, he can start to take some responsibility. But then the fathers, and I know because I'm a father, when you become a father, it's all about everybody else, right? Father's Day's coming up in a couple weeks, and I'll buy myself some presents. I mean, it's, a, it's just a weird awakening when you get, you've got your kids like, ah, Father's Day is happening, it's awesome. And they get a little older and they go, oh, they'll probably get me something, this will be cool. And then you realize, they're buying me something I don't want with my money. <laughs> this isn't really Father's Day. How, is it, how, did, how did this happen? But that's okay. That's what you are when you're a dad. That's what a dad wants to do. I tell you right now, I don't have any greater joy than to... Uh, Send my kids money. I love it. You got kids in college. You know, I love it. Hey, Dad. Oh, you should go do that. Do you have enough money? Oh, no, I don't think I can afford it. No, no, you should go do it. I'll send you money. And I just get happy giving away my money. <laughs> just, you know, don't buy me a present I don't need. Just spend it on your guys, on yourselves. <laughs> Make Father's Day happier. When you're, when you're a father, the father is the person who's and this would be a biblical concept, not necessarily in the world. You don't see this maybe too much, but this is what the Bible would say is that this father's here and he's, and he's caring for everybody. And he's not thinking about meeting his own needs and he's thinking about meeting everybody else's needs. And he, and he bites the bullet. He takes the hit and he doesn't do what he feels like doing. He does, he does what he should do. There might be something inside of him that's saying, you should be this and you should do this. But a man is a, someone who says no to himself for the benefit of other people. That's how you know you're a father. And if you're not doing that, then you need to change and start to become more like that. That's what a father is. That's what a father does. And so he's writing here to these leaders, and he says, listen, if you're going to make the impact you want to make, you're going to have to pay attention, first taking heed to yourself, and not in the sense of being self-focused, but in the sense of recognizing you need to let God work in your life so that you can be an example and then you need to take heed to what's going on in people's lives so that you can help them. You need to see who's carrying a heavy load so you can come over there and help them carry it. You need to see who's not carrying a heavy load so you can go over there and put some more stuff in their backpack. Not like the Pharisees who loaded up burdens on people. But many times, a leader taking heed to the flock is able to come alongside somebody and encourage them and say, you know, you should go do that. 
You should do that, man. You should keep charging. We'll have your back. Like, tell, Let us know how we can help you. But you should do it. You should charge, man. Let it go. So paying attention, having your eyes open. But there's some more things here that are extremely important and probably even of a, of a more fundamental nature. He says, Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, in verse 28. And then he said, Among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I want to take all of those phrases, but begin with the last phrase, which says, He purchased the church with his own blood. Now, we're not going to understand any of the other things if we don't understand that first. The church is not my church. If you say, oh, someone says, where do you go to church? Oh, I go to Rich Chaffin's church. Well, I don't have a church. Jesus has a church. We're hoping that we're part of it. <laughs> we're hopeful. <laughs> We've accepted Christ. We believe what he said about himself. We believe what the Bible says about himself. Like we're, we're hopeful that we're part of the church that belongs to Jesus, but there isn't a church that belongs to me. And, and, and for a leader, you, you have to remind yourself constantly, and this, this isn't just for the pastor of the church, it's for every person that's part of the church, because every person that's part of the church has a responsibility, and there's a fundamental recognition that the church does not belong to any one of us. How many church fights could be stopped if people just recognize the church doesn't belong to you? You know churches have split over the color of the drapes or the color of the carpet? You know, churches have split over so many foolish and petty things. And you, I've been in conversations, uh, not recently, but many years ago. I, I was part of a different denomination, and I was, I, was, I was an eyewitness to a couple of different church splits. And I remember watching them as a, as a young man learning the ministry, and I wasn't really part of the situation, but I was a fly on the wall watching it unfold. And I can't tell you how silly it sounds when you think of the conversation that these people are having about something that doesn't belong to them. It's like if you came over to my house and someone else came to my house and you started arguing about what color my carpet should be. That would be stupid, wouldn't it? Finally, I would, wouldn't I just interview? And they're like, look, it, neither one of you guys has a vote. Be quiet, let's have lunch, man. You're driving me crazy. But can you imagine the, all the fighting that goes on and it, that would just end immediately... If we just say, who does the church belong to? It's Jesus. Well, then who said you had to say? That includes me. What we're trying to do as believers is seek the Lord together and seeking the Lord together, hear from the Lord and get that, that common, that uh, one accord. The early church, they're in one accord. They're all in one accord. They're seeking the Lord together. Everybody's put down their agenda, but boy, you get some people together and they've got an agenda. This is how the woman's tea is going to be this year. They've been way too nice to those ladies. It's time to get... I served there the last couple of years. It's time to put those ladies in their place. We're going to go for a much more military theme. Someone else comes in and, you know, they're a hippie artist. Like, we just need more love. We should have no tables, no structure. Let's just come in and all just be one. Everyone gives to everyone. I mean... Couldn't you have, I mean, if you get different people, you're going to have all these different perspectives. But listen, the, when we're together as the family of God, there's a head. We have a dad, right? And, and there's a Lord of the church. There's a name that's above every name. There's, there's a commander in chief. There's a, there's a king of kings. There's the one who bought the church with his own blood. Now, if you buy something with your own blood, it's probably pretty precious to you, right? I've never bought anything with my own blood. And if someone was trying to sell me something, they said, I'll give you this for your blood. I said, pretty much, uh, I don't think I need it. Uh, well, wait, how much blood? No, all your blood. I don't think I need it that bad. There's nothing in the world that I would buy with all of my blood. But Jesus bought the church with all of his blood. <laughs> I think he probably, probably has a pretty strong opinion about it, pretty committed to it. It's his. He purchased it. The word isn't necessarily has the connotation of buy. It has the connotation of making your own, of getting for yourself, of acquiring. Probably is a, is a more accurate word that we would. He acquired it to himself with his own blood. He made it his with his blood. So that being the case, if I'm going to take heed to myself and to all the flock, that's an underlying principle there. Well, why would I want to do that? Well, because it belongs to Jesus. He bought it with his blood. I'm going to be serving him by serving his people. 
I'm going to care about what he cares about, and so I'll care about his people. That will help us understand the phrase to shepherd the church of God. Sometimes leaders have gotten astray with this word, shepherd. The idea that sheep, you know, and then we know this is just a, just a common um, knowledge thing, that sheep are the dumbest of all the livestock animals. They're just dumb. There's no way around it. But I've, I've been with Christian leaders where they start talking about the sheep. Well, the sheep are this and the sheep are that. And I keep thinking, you're a sheep. <laughs> Take it easy when you say stuff about sheep because <laughs> you is one. And, and you know, if you, you, keep, you keep running them under the bus, you know, I think, you know, you're a shepherd, but you're a sheep. And there's really the shepherd. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. So we have a shepherd. Jesus is the sh- chief shepherd. Anybody else would be an under-shepherd who's taking care of what Jesus bought with his blood. <laughs> well, that changes your perspective, right? Hey, Pastor Rich, you know, I, I, you know, I, you're just, you're, 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 and, you know some, someone could want to elevate me, and, and I could receive that and say, well, I'm glad you noticed my greatness. <laughs> you know, stick around, you'll notice other things. It won't, <laughs> it won't take long. Um, but, you know, you could have this idea of, like, being a, a shepherd it would sort of elevate you, but actually, if the church is bought with the blood of Jesus and he's the chief shepherd, then basically we're sheep slaves. <laughs> we're, we're surrendered to him to do what he wants to do with the thing that he bought with his blood. Now, how could you be boasting about that or take a position over other people saying, I know what should happen in your life and you can't make decisions unless you ask me first. Now, that doctrine is such a tragic doctrine and it and I remember when I was first saved, it was really big in the, in the mid-80s. It had kind of spread through a whole section of the church, this shepherding movement. They called it, they were shepherds. And so you weren't allowed to buy a car without talking to your shepherd. Everybody that were part of these churches, they all were connected to a shepherd, and those shepherds were under other shepherds. It was very controlling. And people, you couldn't, you couldn't date somebody unless your shepherd said it was okay. You couldn't buy anything. You, you, where you were going to live, they would decide if you had a couple of roommates and you wanted to move and go where someone else, your, your shepherds would tell you, you can't do that. Or no, this person's going to move into your house. Like, well, what do you mean they're going to move? No, they are. I'm the shepherd. And that doctrine was very popular and it had, it had a big impact in the, in the church um, across the board, not just in one particular denomination, but many churches were trying to deal with that. And I remember when it happened, I remember thinking, man, that's just, that's just so weird and sad and cult-like. And, and I remember when it, and it died, like all those weird doctrines die. They only can last for so long until you realize all the shepherds are totally corrupt and they're ripping everything. You know, there's always some weird thing that happens and the thing blows up and falls apart. But you know, that has come back again. Like, it's not, it, we're not dealing with it here, but I've seen it in other churches, not, not in our area, not far away, have gone through that. Um, there, there are all these weird things related to leaders taking a role in other people's lives that the Bible just doesn't give them. The role that the leader has is to be an example, to share the word of God. And when it says to shepherd the flock of God, what does that mean? What does the shepherd do with his sheep? Is he, is he out there trying to get their money and getting all the sheep to tithe 10% of their wool all the time? I'm mean, like, what? <laughs> the shepherd has the sheep, and he just makes sure that they have all their needs met. That's what a shepherd does. He's not trying to figure out, like, where's the, where's the good lawn that's by In-N-Out Burger? You know, I'll, I'll, I could get him penned up here and I can go eat. The shepherd is just going where there's still water. He knows that they're going to struggle if the water's moving too fast. They'll, they'll be afraid. So he's thinking of what, how they're at, what their state is, how he can help them. He brings them to the green pastures. He watches over them. When they all go to sleep, he sleeps in such a way as that they'll all be protected. And if something comes, he's going to protect them from it. And they'll be able to sleep soundly, but he'll be awake. You see, it's not a position of lording it over other people. In fact, it's just the opposite. It's the taking the position of making other people more important than yourself. Now, that's why I'm willing to teach on this on a Sunday morning, because that's not a leadership principle. That's a Jesus principle. If you're going to follow Jesus, this is how we all think. Now, I'm not saying that we're all going to be occupying a role of being a shepherd or having a you know, an overseer role within the church officially, we won't. Not everyone's called and gifted in certain ways. But every single person, what he's talking about here, ultimately at the bottom line is that the 
the church, the people, they all belong to God. He bought them with his blood. And now we all, you can take a role of being an example and caring for other people more than you care about yourself. Well, that's all God's people, right? That's what it is to be a Christian. Jesus said, if you want to be my, be my disciple, you have to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow me. The first part of following Jesus is to embrace self-denial. To embrace the idea that I'm not looking at this thing as it relates to me, but I'm looking at it as it relates to other people. And when you get a hold of that, your life really changes. Your peace will really change. Because God keeps those in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon him because they trust in him. So the peace of God comes when you're committing the things to the Lord and you're just living in surrender. The peace of God comes. Joy comes from the Holy Spirit. He pours it out in your heart. But looking at others before you look at yourself fills your heart with joy. Fills your heart with joy. Love. Love is perfectly expressed in laying down your life for somebody else and choosing this other person's welfare and benefit above your own. So while this is specifically to to the mature overseers in the fellowship, that's that small group that's come out to the beach. Yet what he says here is so fundamentally important. The church belongs to God. He's purchased it with his own blood. Their role then is to take the, the care for those people that are so precious to God and to make sure that the water that they need and that the food that they need and that the dangers they need to avoid, that, that those people will be protected and well-watered and well-fed. And that that group of people exist because they belong to God and they're for him and they're not for the under shepherd. They're not for him to take advantage of or to, to, to make uh, in service to him. There's another word that's used here and it's the word overseer among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. The Holy Spirit is the one who cares for the church. He lives in our hearts. He's made up our hearts his home. The Bible says our own bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. So we have the Holy Spirit working in us, the new birth. We're a new creation in Christ, born of the Spirit. But the Holy Spirit also works within the church. He gifts people. He gives spiritual gifts, spiritual enablings that we don't have naturally. He gives them to us so that we can use them to minister to one another. When I got saved, God gave me some certain gifts that I could use to help people who are walking with Jesus. I got them when I got saved. The Holy Spirit came upon me and and I found myself teaching people. And the problem was, as I didn't know anything about the Bible. <laughs> but what happened was, I'd read my Bible every day, and I'd read my Bible, and God would show me something out of the Scripture, and then I'd be talking to someone later in the day, and their, their life story fit exactly. I was like, I just read that this morning. Now, I'd only been saved four days. I only knew four things, the four things I read. You know, I, I didn't have any. If they asked me any follow-up questions, I would have been done. But, you know, you're... There's, there's a spiritual enabling, a spiritual gifting. It came from the Lord. God gave me that gift so that then I would help other people. There are lots of different gifts of the Holy Spirit that God gives. And the Holy Spirit looks at the whole flock, the whole family of God, the, the flock that God bought with his own blood, and then the Spirit gives all these diverse gifts to all these different people. And then we all use those gifts to serve one another. And the leadership that develops is not a coordinator leadership that dictates to everybody and tells everybody what to do. We already have that person. His name is Jesus. He's the head of the body. <laughs> That's the analogy. The head, all the parts of the body are connected to the head. So if everybody learns how to be connected to Jesus, then Jesus can dictate to everybody what he wants done. And then we have servants that help, help us when we bump into each other and help us to recognize the will of God and people with more experience. The, the words for leader are overseer here, which literally means overseer. Uh, using my astounding Greek knowledge to share that with you. It's the word scope, where we get our English word scope. And then the, the word epi, episkopos, where we get the word episcopalian. That's a, it became a formal church structure. But the word literally means to scope around, to look around. So these are the guys that are not looking at themselves, they're looking around. You can tell a person who's an overseer because when they walk out of the service, they notice the person who's standing by themselves because they're, they're looking around. The person that's not that is wondering why everything's not working oriented towards them. That person got in my lane. That person cut me off. That person following too close. That person's flying right above me. That person's, you know, the, the growth as a, as a mature person, because that's the other word, elder, 
And the word elder just means someone who's older. And generally speaking, older means wiser and more mature because the person has lived longer as a stupid person to learn <laughs> all the dumb things that they did so that now they can say, look, you don't want to do that. Well, why are you always telling me what to do? Because I did the exact same stupid thing. And I did it four times. And I don't want to see you do it four times before you get it through your head that that was a terrible idea. The word elder just simply means mature. Now Paul told Timothy when he was young and he was ministering, don't let anyone despise your youth because you can have great maturity as a young person. It doesn't necessarily mean an old person. You could be an old person and have not learned anything. You could still be just as foolish as you've ever been doing the same foolish things. So it's not necessarily an age thing, although age usually means that you've learned the hard way. So, um, but the word means mature. So we have got these words, a mature person who's looking out for other people. Why? Because they belong to Jesus, and all these people were bought by his blood, and this person loves Jesus, and they've grown to maturity. Maturity means thinking about others besides yourself. So what does it mean then to shepherd the flock or to be an overseer? It means to care about people and meet their needs. It doesn't mean that you get to boss everyone else around and wear different clothes and, and make sure everybody knows that you're elder so-and-so or pastor rich or whatever title that you take for yourself, archbishop, his holiness, <laughs> the great one, the apostle, whatever. In, uh, in Ghana, where we've done ministry for so long, there's, uh, there's just a lot of this nonsense that goes on. And I think a lot of it, one of their struggles is because they're so, they have so much tribalism that just their way of thinking is, is elevating someone into a chief status. So that just so easily translates into the church. So you got a guy who becomes a pastor, and then he just makes the church like the tribe, where I'm the chief, these are my sub-chiefs, and everybody serves us. That's how it is in the village, but that's not how Jesus is. And so the guys that are learning the Word of God, and so many of the guys have just been amazing examples of what God's doing in their lives, but uh, the, the, where the Bible school is that we have in Ghana, they've started a church now, and uh, they're, they, they're building a building, I think it's almost done, and and so they've, they've begun a church. Been, we've been in the same village for 10 years and, and didn't want to come and take away from the other churches. But after this long period of time, it just seems like this is the right thing. And we've always needed sort of a model church so that the guys, when they come to the school, can um, have an example. And, and so Danae's pastoring this church. So I, was, I called him on the phone this week, and I was, or last week, and I was teasing him. And uh, I asked him when he was going to make his poster. And, and so in, in Ghana, what happens is these guys make these fanciful posters with like lightning in the background or a big skyline and then their head cheaply photoshopped into it. You know, the apostle, flames and wonders and something ministries and, and all the titles of the ministries are all, you know, fire and wonder and sounds of fury international. And, uh, you know, the bishop so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. And, and uh, we've had former students, you know, um, that... that they, go, they, they leave the school, and they've gone, they've learned the Bible, and they go back, and then they, you know, you'll see a flyer with it, and you know the guy, and it's like, I don't know about that. Oh, come on. Bro, what are you, like, what are you doing? But it, that's just so natural, and it's not, it's just a human nature thing, and all of our cultures are susceptible to it in different ways. So Paul's making it really clear to these guys, the church belongs to Jesus. He bought it with his blood. Careful. So what, what do I do then? I get my eyes off myself. So I take heed to myself, get my eyes off myself. I take heed to myself. I get my eyes on Jesus. I've become that example. And then I look around and see how people are doing. And I, and I love them because they belong to Jesus. That's ministry. And that's a safe place. And uh, we're not going to make posters. And, and I, so I, I, I called him. I said, hey, Pastor Donay, you know, do you have your poster yet? He said, oh, not yet. But when I get one, I'll send it to you. <laughs> Can you imagine if Dene was a poster? We should make one, though. <laughs> oh, you know I'm going to. I want to make him one, send it to him. Go, hey, I've already thought about it. I think, I, I think I'm good. We're close. Now, here's why they have to watch out, and this is, uh, this is tragic. He says, verse 29, I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. That's the first danger. Second danger, verse 30. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch. So back to the idea of taking heed. So you need to watch. What are they watching for first and foremost? 
You've got to watch out for people that will come in from the outside to try to take advantage of this flock that's in love with Jesus. Because what happens when people are in love with Jesus? They become super generous. What happens when people are in love with Jesus? They grow in kindness. What happens when people are in love with Jesus? Is they grow in patience. When people are in love with Jesus, they want to help people. They see someone in need, and they'll just give you their last dollar when someone's in love with the Lord. And so wolves will come, and they'll try to take advantage of that fresh and beautiful work that God's doing to try to, make the, to use the, the people of God to satisfy their own desires. You see, when a shepherd looks at the flock, he sees, if you think in this context, this under-shepherd would look at that flock and think, these are the people God bought with his own blood. How can I lay down my life for them? The wolf looks at the flock and says, they look fat. How can I eat them? And let me tell you, people come to our church trying to figure out how they can eat us. And that's why we have shepherds. That's why we have overseers. That's why we have people watching out. That's why God's given us spiritual gifts. We have one of the great spiritual gifts is called discerning spirits. I have that gift. That's one of the gifts that probably operates most strongly in my life. The Holy Spirit just shows me what's going on spiritually. I don't know the details, but I just always know. So I always, I'm almost always the first one to notice there's a wolf. But we've got other, other folks in the church, men and women, who have that same gift. And almost as soon as I notice, they notice. I mean, we're, the, God's given us these gifts. It's like radar. And you just see the wolfie. You're like, Grandma, those aren't your eyes. <laughs> And Grandma, those aren't your canines. You know, those are, that's a wolf right there. And, and so we know right away. We know right away. And we just, we just pray and we watch and we wait and we're careful and we, we pay attention. Um, I remember one fellow a long time ago, back when we were at McKee, he walked in and I don't know, I don't know, I don't know how to explain it to you, but the, I just knew, I was like, that guy's a wolf. And uh, he, I watched him walk around the room, and he's looking. He, he was looking, at, and I knew what he was looking for. And he walked. He walked across the back, and he walked back across the back, and then he sat down by a pretty girl. And uh, and so I thought, all right, that's strike one. You know, we'll we'll see what happens here. I went and told the guys right after. I go, you watch this guy talking to this girl. If he walks with her to the parking lot, you deal with him. And this is a wolf. We're, we got sisters. I got I got a sister. You mess with my sister, it, it's not going to happen because my brother's crazy. I mean, I, that's why I got to watch out, you know, because I had to pull my brother off the guy. He came back the next week, did exactly the same thing. I, but it was weird because I was standing right where I, I mean, it was just, I was talking to somebody, and I just saw him out of the corner of my eye, I saw him, I'm like, there he is, watch out. I mean, the Spirit's speaking to me. Watch that guy. He's going to do the same thing again. He did the same thing as like a shark going back and forth. He's looking for the same girl, sat by her again. Strike two. And, that, and so I, the guys warned him, and he freaked out. I'm not here for that. Can I sit by whoever I want? And we said, no, you can't sit by whoever you want. That's a single girl, and you're a single guy, and you're only here to sit by her. She's beautiful, and you're a wolf. <laughs> he never came back. You know that wonderful psalm, your rod and your staff, they comfort me? What does a shepherd use with his, what does he do with the rod? Like, you got, the wolves are going to get me. <laughs> Don't worry. What are you going to do with that big stick? It's for hitting wolves. <laughs> We're blessed, you know? We got a lot of guys. I've always been so blessed having Brad Cooley do the sound ministry because Brad's got a great gift of discernment. He's, he's, he's just for years, he's in a vantage point where he watches the whole service, both services, Sunday morning, and he just watches it, and he's like a sniper. Uh, <laughs> It's like we, he, just, he just, and the Spirit just speaks to him and he just prays. I mean, he doesn't, we're, he, we're not, we don't run around. I mean, that, I had to go back to McKee. How long ago were, were we at McKee? Like, so don't, if you're here, and like, if, if, when I looked at a girl, like, I'm a single guy, they're going to beat me. No, no, no. I, had, I went back, like, it was like 12 years ago. Th- this happened maybe four times where, you know, we don't just pray it and it changes, right? We're not, we're not running around trying to beat people up. But, if there's a wolf, if there's a wolf, man, the Lord reveals them. We've been so blessed, so blessed. We have all these little kids here, all these precious children. Man, God has to protect us, right? These doors are open, man. With it, we want the, the church has to be open for anybody to come home. Then we've got all these precious little kids. 
We better have the gifts of the Spirit. We better have overseers. We better have people that have their eyes open. So people will come in from the outside, and then this is also sad, verse 30, people from yourselves will rise up. People will rise up from among yourselves speaking perverse things. Now I wish that the New King James didn't translate it as perverse, because the word perverse, in my language, means something that's nasty. When I think of that, that's perverted. I think in ter- it's, it's used most commonly in my language, my culture, my whatever, as something that's like inherently nasty. The word simply means warped a little bit or distorted. So they're going to speak perverse things. It's not as, don't think of them as they're going to speak, you know, bad words or something nasty. They're going to have the thing almost right. It's just going to be melted on one side a little bit. It's going to be almost exactly the right thing. It's just going to be, oh, it's going to be twisted a little bit. The feet are pointing that way and the head's pointing that way. You're like, that doesn't look exactly right. That, that's close, but that's not quite it. People will rise up even from within your own ranks, Paul said, and there will be something twisted. There'll be something a little off. And the whole point will be to draw away disciples after themselves. Now, if, if Jesus bought the church with his own blood, how do you think he feels about someone taking his blood-bought people and bringing them to themselves? <laughs> Don't do that. Watch out for that, he says. They will speak these twisted things to draw away disciples after themselves. Therefore, watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, verse 32, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. In light of the fact that we have this incredible responsibility with a church bought by the blood of Jesus to take care of it, to shepherd it, and you know this um, calling of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's made you overseers, the reality that wolves will come in from the outside, men from within. So what in the world are we going to do? Look at how simple it is in verse 32. I commend you to God and to his word. That's it. You know what will protect us? The same thing that's always protected us. God and his word. So when someone comes in with something a little bit off, you look at that and you go, that's, you know, there's another verse that says something about that and it kind of contradicts what you're saying. (laughs) Right? The, The Bereans, they tested the things that Paul said. We've got the word of God. Test everything, the Bible says. Hold fast that, that which is good. I commend you to God and the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. God's word will build us up. That's why as a church, and in this whole section, the, the emphasis on his preaching of the gospel, his not holding anything back, giving them the whole counsel of God, telling these guys, oversee the flock, look after the flock, tend the flock. But here's how. The word of God, it will build you up. When, when Jesus was calling Peter the ministry, he said, feed my sheep. When Peter then told the elders that he was training, he said, feed the flock. Paul is telling these guys, feed the flock, take care of the flock. I commend you to God and to the word of his grace. It will always be the word of God that will transcend all cultures. We're living in a time our culture is going through some kind of craziness. This last week is a crazy week culturally. The things going on in our world, that internationally. The world we're living around is very crazy. It's very uncertain. It's very unsettled. There are, there are people who have agendas uh, that are so dangerous uh, to people's physical well-being, to their mental state, and, and the, the whole world, our own, our own part of it, and the whole world is just so crazy right now. Well, what's the answer? I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. Because the word of God will never change. The word of God will never change. Hey, the French had the French Revolution and people were getting their heads chopped off. The guillotine, and killing the whole ruling class and just this craziness. What needs to happen in a situation like that? Man, you need people to get on fire for Jesus, start sharing the word of God. I mean, you just go through history. Think of the, the first century. The, Romans, the Roman Caesar says, I'm God. I'm a God. I am the king. I'm the only king. And you must say, I'm Lord. We can't, we're Christians. We've got to say, Jesus is Lord. No, I'm the only Lord. You need to confess me as the only Lord. You know, you think of the early church where, where it began, that, that fiery furnace. You think of Daniel and his friends in Babylon, in literally in a fiery furnace. What's always the answer? I commend you to God. God's always going to win, you guys. Right? I, I heard somebody a few months ago about one of the social debates of, you know, this immorality they're trying to say is normal. 
and, say, and someone said, you know, you're going to be on the wrong side of this. Really? I'm on God's side. <laughs> I mean, uh, sorry, bro. Like, that will never happen. If you, you build your life on the rock that is the word of God, you'll never regret it. You never, ever regret it. Now, the culture is going to swing on the trapeze through all over the place, reacting, counter-reacting, and all the things that it does from one extreme to the other. From a super legalistic, weird, you know, stoicism to an epicureanism and all, that's the culture. It's going to always do that. The word of God never changes. So Paul says, I commend you to God and to his word. The word of his grace, it'll build you up. It'll give you an inheritance among those who are sanctified. We'll stop there. We'll pick up this last part of his example tonight. Now, I wanted to encourage you. I... um, I think that Jesus sent his disciples out to make disciples. He said, go into all the world and make disciples. And so one of the things that um, has to become, is, becomes part of the DNA of the church and has to be sort of the, the way that we think about things is that we're trying to make disciples. And, and so I want to just encourage you, um, you know, there, there aren't many that are going to become a missionary or become a pastor uh, I've been, you guys know I've been speaking at a lot of different pastors' conferences all over the country and the world, and one of the things I almost always say when I get, have that opportunity to start off with, just to kind of give everybody a perspective, is I'll say, raise your hand if you're not a pastor. And like 90% of the people raise their hands. It's like, okay, good, I'm talking to you guys. <laughs> you know, because you can look at this and say, well, this, he's talking to the elders, and I'm not an elder. Or, you know, he's talking that this is the thing. No, no, he's talking about the most real things. This is the most substantive and real for the follower of Jesus. You've got the evangelistic passages in the book of Acts. You've got the the sorting out, the legalism passage in the book of Acts. You've got Paul addressing an angry mob, preaching to the pagan Roman leaders in Caesarea. But here we've got an address to the Christians. Now don't think that, well, these guys are elders. I'm not an elder. Listen, what did we look at today that can't apply to your life? Can you get your eyes off yourself? Isn't that what the Spirit's telling you? Can you put your eyes on other people and care about more other people before yourself? Can you ask God to give you the gifts so that you can take care of the people that he bought with his own blood? I mean, this is Christianity. Now, the, the elders or the overseers are just people who are examples of that. I mean, it, 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 we, we, we want to, you know, I just, we just wanna, I just want to make it really clear that, that God has a plan for your life and he wants to use you to change the world. And primarily... The, what the pastors or the missionaries are the ones that have notoriety, they're kind of equipping people, but all the ministry gets done by everybody. That's how it works. So be encouraged. I pray the Lord would speak to you. Father, we ask in Jesus' name that you would help us to hear and understand. And I pray that you would encourage, Lord. I pray this message would be encouraging as we sort it through in our minds about what you want to do with us and in us and through us. And I pray that we'd be inspired, Lord, to to minister to other people. I, I think back in my Christian life and the, the people that had a huge impact on me never became a pastor. Um, so many that, that their example and their life and their love for me, their care for me and their concern at different seasons of my life just meant so much. And, and I just pray that you'd inspire each one of us to be an example and to take heed to ourselves and to the flock that that you paid such a great price to buy and make your own. So Lord, work by your Spirit. And and Lord, if there's anybody here who needs to make a turn in their life, they've been living just in the wrong direction, and pray, Lord, that you would help them make that turn today, that you'd give them a heart of repentance, a heart and a mind to change, and to say, what have I been doing? I'm so miserable just trying to make myself happy, and I want to live for Jesus. So, Lord, help, help people make that change. If anyone needs to, Lord, stir up their hearts. We thank you, Lord, for um, your presence with us and your ability to answer our prayers beyond what we could ask or think. So do that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you're here and you need to make that decision for the Lord, um, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Someone brought you to church or you came by yourself or you knew about church in the past and you you know you're here you need to and you need to get right with the lord don't leave without without doing that um
can open your heart to Jesus. Up here in the front, there'll be some folks that'd love to pray with you. If you want to get some prayer for something, you're going through something, there's a sickness or a, a trial in the family, uh, just come on up here. These guys would love to pray with you. And, and if just through the message, you just thought, you know what, I want to I wanna be making a difference. There's, if the Spirit's speaking to you, the best thing you can do is tell somebody and have them pray for you. It's just just ask right then because God hears prayers and he answers them. So if you need prayer, make your way to the front. Other than that, if you're dismissed, God bless you. And we'll see you back here tonight for communion.